And so a lot of the work that I like to do with people is really getting to like, what's working for you in this moment? And if you can imagine a future self, what would that future self want? And can you check in with that future self about whether or not you're doing right now what you need to do in order to get to that future self? Hi, Kyle and the whole Mudwater team. This is Molly from Minnesota, and it's a really beautiful sunny morning here. I just had my mud water while I was listening to the birds sing, and I then listened to your podcast with Rick Doblin, and you guys were talking about treatments for PTSD, and I wanted to call in and talk to you guys because I was just diagnosed with severe PTSD this week and I found your episode to be so encouraging and inspiring and boy I did not expect mud water to touch this many parts of my life so thank you guys hey Molly thank you for sending that in that was a very touching voice memo uh, and very brave for just being real about what you're going through. I think that PTSD is so much more common in our society than we like to admit, and isolation just makes it worse. So when we can be honest about our experience, be vulnerable enough to share, um, it can make people feel less lonely, and it that helps everyone. Um, get through this crazy experience called life. So go Molly. And thank you again. If anyone else wants to send a voice memo in to be played on this podcast, you can just bust out your phone, record less than a minute of audio and let us know who you are, where you're listening from, you know, maybe a quick poem that you're inspired by, what it looks like, where you are in this situation right now. And you can just shoot it over to podcast at mudwtr.com. Welcome to Trends with Benefits. My name is Kyle Tierman, and this episode of the podcast is with relationship coach Sarah Russell. Sarah is a Qigong instructor as well as relationship coach, and she helps her clients analyze behaviors, relationships, and systems to see where old habits are no longer serving them. She's the real deal. Um, I've actually worked with Sarah personally on some relationship stuff, and she helped me tremendously. So I hope that you get um, a lot of practical um, tools from this podcast. And if you want to go further than that, um, you can reach out to Sarah Russell. She offers um, just really high quality um, relationship coaching, and we will link to all of her stuff in the description below. And finally, if you would like to check out written stories from Trends with Benefits, head over to trendswithbenefits.com, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, every week, we offer best-in-class journalism, a lot of really funny stories in the spaces of psychedelics, adventure, and well-being. And with that, hope that you all have a wonderful day, and please welcome to the show, Sarah Russell. Sarah Russell in the house. Let's start off by explaining what it is that you do. Sure. So I'm a skills for change coach. That means I come from a radical lineage. There was a movement in the late 60s, early 70s in Berkeley where a bunch of radical psychiatrists got together and decided that rather than focusing on the biological components of people's diagnoses, they really wanted to talk about the cultural reasons for why people were experiencing depression, anxiety, and a variety of other disorders. And so there was a free clinic in Berkeley, and they were the mental health arm of it. And they started treating vets who had PTSD and that kind of thing. But they were doing it from this radical perspective where they were talking about what in the environment was causing them to have problems rather than what was internally, intrinsically wrong with them. Okay. And how did you first hear about it? Mm, my friend Molly Katzman, she's in town, she's local, um, she's certified as a coach, and I was struggling with a relationship. I just was trying everything that I could, and nothing was making it work, and she kept telling me, you know who you need to talk to is this person who trained me, and eventually I did. Um, I remember that that first phone call, it was like a free 20-minute that we all do, and I think I cried the entire 20 minutes, 
And at the end of it, um, she was compassionate, but she also had some very clear structure for what I could do next. And that was encouraging. Um, I've done Qigong. I've studied a little bit of Tibetan Buddhism. And there are these ideals within Taoism and Buddhism that I would really like to reach, but I didn't have pragmatic tools for how to get there. And all of a sudden, this woman, Nancy Chanteau, was like, here's how you do it step by step with micro interventions. And all of a sudden, I could like piece together like where I wanted to go with where I was. Right. There's a lot of uh, mountaintops that we can see, but we don't necessarily see the trail to get there. That's exactly it's like, it. It's like someone telling you to just believe in yourself. It was that. It's like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. And and, yeah. and there is a lot of that um, general thinking and general language in those circles like Qigong, just the Santa Cruz wooiness, which is like you, you, when you really get down to what it is that they're talking about, um, we all want that. It's like more connection more love, more self-acceptance. Okay, these things all seem good. Feeling presence when you're in the midst of someone else and you know, feeling comfortable with yourself. How do you actually do that? Right. Right? What what are the questions that you can ask yourself? What are the practices that you can enact that allow you to take those first steps on the trail up to that mountain? Right. That's exactly it. So, what were the uh what were those first steps that you taught? Let's, what were the first questions that um, this woman, Nancy, was asking you that was that were uh, making you cry for the whole 20 minutes? Yeah, well, I, I remember I was really frustrated in the beginning because she kept asking me how depleted I was. And I didn't want to talk about how depleted I was. I wanted to talk about solutions and how to fix my problems and what did I need to do next. And she would just keep asking me, how depleted are you? Have you been replenishing? Did you get enough sleep? Have you had enough food? And I was I was really resentful for those first few calls because I was like, when are we gonna actually do something? When are we gonna get somewhere? Um, but really depletion was where I needed to start. I was, I mean, part of the reason I was so teary was because I was exhausted. I was completely worn out. I was feeling heartbroken and I needed to manage my depletion before any other creative solutions were gonna become available. And I had to put trust in her that that was, that was going to get me somewhere. Um, I was resistant every step of the way, but eventually I did commit to my replenishment and that did create other opportunities for me to create change. How would you define depletion? Sure. So I know... There you go. Just leave that. Boom. Perfect. The- <laughs> <laughs> We're doing microphone, uh, microphone training. <laughs> The grandmama of Skills for Change, her name is Julia Kelleher, yeah. and she defines depletion as low life force energy. Okay. And so that's going to be dif- uh, that's going to be fatigue, um, anxiety. It's when you don't have that sparkle in your eye or that bounce in your step anymore. But yeah, basically low life force energy. Okay. And how can you even know when you're depleted? Right. It's like the the parable about the two uh, small fish swimming through water, right? And the old fish. Um, swims by and goes, Hey boys, how's the water? And one fish goes to the other and is, uh, says, what the What's hell is water? water? <laughs> right. Yeah. If you've been living in this state of depletion in this culture where you don't know anything else besides reactivity, it, you always saw that raising your voice was the way to get what you want. That was all that was modeled for you. Um, how do you know anything different? How do you even figure out what the, um, I don't know what the, what the, like where you sit on the scale. Yeah. So capitalist grind is real. And this idea that if we're not exhausted all the time, we're probably not doing enough. That's real. Julia actually created a 20 point scale where at the top we've got a positive 10 that's full empowerment and plenitude. And at that point you can see possibilities and you also have a clear yes and a clear no at the other end of the scale we have a negative 10 which is despair and powerlessness it there may be some kind of suicidal ideation there not necessarily but it's definitely questioning your belonging on the planet why am i here why am i doing what i'm doing and you need external help and then in between those two numbers we have different markers for how you could identify where you could be so for instance at a five, you're probably feeling pretty optimistic. You've got some self-esteem, but it's really easy to give your energy away. And so you're probably overextending yourself at a positive five. Whereas at a positive seven, it 
it's likely that you're holding your boundaries a little bit better. So we have markers for how we can decide where somebody is on the scale. Do you find that people you work with who are chronically depleted have a hard time saying no? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, We need energy in order to hold our boundaries and we need energy in order to cooperate. And part of cooperation is being able to say, this is what I want and I can hear what you want. And then we can come to some new agreement that encompasses both of us. If you don't have energy, you can't do that. It's really hard to say yes. It's really hard to say no. Mm. And when you get, when you figure out, uh, when you work with someone, it, do you start with asking about depletion usually just to get that sense? That is often one of the first questions I'm asking. Although I know that most people who are coming to talk to me, they're going to start at about a negative five on average because most people don't come to me when they're at a positive five and they're like, I'm living a really good life. I want you to teach me how to live my best life. What can you do for me? People aren't coming to me until they're depleted, until they're exhausted, until they've um, worked through all of their other resources. And I'm kind of a... Uh, the last line of defense. I recently uh, went and saw a chiropractor because my mom had an appointment and she had to cancel. So she asked if I wanted it. And I said, oh, that sounds nice. So I went to see the chiropractor and he's like, all right, so what's wrong with you? And I was like, I'm actually feeling good right now. (laughs) And he's like, well, why are you here then? (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Because I want to be better, man. Right, Right, right. And I can actually offer that to people. It's just most people aren't asking for it. Right. Most people are are coming to you as a last resort. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. When you figure out how depleted people are, what then? So I ask about the basics. So a little bit of Maslow's hierarchy, like, are you getting enough sleep? Do you have safe shelter? How are you, you know, feeding yourself? Is it nourishing food? Is it comforting food? If people are covering the basics already, then I get a little bit higher. Well, like, what's stressing you out in your life? What's your job like? What are your relationships like? So I'm going through kind of systematically and trying to see what's going on in people's lives. Sometimes it's, um, it's just like drink more water and get more sleep. Sometimes it's really easy like that. Sometimes it's something where there needs to be a radical change around a relationship dynamic or, like I said, um, the work environment. And then... That's that's a slower process. Um, yeah. There are a lot of different selves that we show up as. And I find that often it has to do with those basic factors that you just mentioned. Like, are you getting enough sleep? Mm-hmm. How How is your diet? Mm-hmm. Um, are you getting enough exercise? Mm-hmm. There was a story of, uh, of Starbucks running into a lot of problems with employees blowing up at customers. Mm. And they deduced that the blowups happened all around the same time of day. Mm. It was when the employees were super depleted late in the day. Yeah. And it's really costly to have an employee blow up at a customer, right? It makes the news. It's it costs them a ton of money. So they changed a structure around when they would allow uh, breaks mm-hmm. and, and the length of the breaks and, it uh, completely solved the problem. Amazing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's just going and taking a breather. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, and as you mentioned, with the culture of America, the the work-centric culture can lead to a kind of spiritual bankruptcy. Yeah. That keeps people's amygdalas really overactive. Mm-hmm. So their normal is a fear response rather than thinking deeply from a space of more um, conscious awareness. Absolutely. That conscious awareness requires a slowing down and a willingness to pause and the capacity to sit in the unknown versus that kind of productivity grind where you're supposed to have all the answers. It's progress for progress sake. Um, constantly being productive, this proving what your value is, those are really different states. Right. Uh, and what are the the questions then that you'll ask someone after uh, you get their sense of depletion, you get, you get their sense of, you know, are they getting enough, you know, the animalistic mm-hmm. needs mm-hmm. meant? Yeah. Where does a session usually go from there? Yeah, once the basics are covered, um, I ask people what their goals are. Like if they could 
imagine their best lives for themselves. And if you're depleted, that's really hard to do. So, you know, there's already a little bit of wishful thinking in this. But if you could imagine an alternative, what would you want your life to look like if you could have anything that you wanted? Not what you think you could get, not what you think you deserve, but if you could have anything you wanted, what would that be? And then once people can describe for me what it is that they want to change, I ask them how they would know that was tangibly happening in their lives. So how would you talk to people? How would you feel? Like, what would your day-to-day look like? What would your ideal day look like? What would your ideal year look like? So I get people to be really specific about what would satisfy them. And Adrienne Marie Brown talks about this really beautifully. Um, she has a podcast with Prentice Hemphill where she talks about this called Finding Our Way. It's Prentice's um, podcast. And it's this idea that you need to name how you're satisfiable in order to be satisfied. You have to be able to be clear about what it is in order to move towards it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like making money. Like Tim Ferriss says this, what's your number before you set out to make a bunch of money? What's your number? Right. Because if you don't, that goalpost is constantly going to shift. Exactly. And the second you start making hundred thousand dollars a year, you're going to probably start hanging out with more people who are making a little bit more than you. And then that's nothing. Okay. Now Mm -hmm. I want to make half a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Wait, no, I'm not even a millionaire yet. Okay. Now I want to be making a million dollars a year. Oh, you know what? I need to be donating to the right causes. And it's like, I need to be, you know, clout chasing. Mm -hmm. It's, there's an endless, uh, there's an endless, um, creep. Yeah. And if you don't set out to figure out what satisfies you at the beginning, mm-hmm. you'll never get there. Right? right. It's like the Jim Car- the Jim Carrey quote: "I wish everyone could get rich and famous so that they could figure out that that's not the answer." Right. Right. Yeah. There is also something that happens with that depletion where if you're coming in and you're not getting good sleep and you're fighting with your partner all the time and you hate your job and then all of a sudden we change those things, we find ways to adapt those things, then that new level that you're at, that new level of replenishment, all of a sudden you're like, oh, when I was at a negative seven on the scale, I was saying, I don't want to fight. I don't want to have to wake up so early in the morning. It was all the things that you don't want. And then all of a sudden when you get into higher numbers, all of a sudden you're able to say what you do want. So your quality of life also like, what you expect for yourself rises. So there's that as well. So like there's this like ever moving target of never being satisfiable. We want to be satisfiable. And then there's also being able to recognize that our desires are going to evolve as we have more life force energy. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because if, if you've been living your whole life, not thinking that you're enough, it's really difficult to even make the statement about what you want. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. As you enter into your 30s, there starts to become a lot more pressure on relationships. Mm. And it goes from your 20s where you uh, society tells you to just have fun, Mm -hmm. go to festivals, enjoy yourselves, take ecstasy, (laughs) get naked, do it. Be a go-go dancer at a Diplo concert. (laughs) And then at 30, they're like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know? Yeah. Right? And uh, a lot of people make unconscious decisions Mm. moving forward in relationships because that's what society tells them to do. Oh, yeah. And then they wake up one day in a house that they don't recognize and a partner that they don't recognize Mm -hmm. and say, holy shit, who am I? Right. How do we avoid that? So I use the language of the relationship escalator. So this was created by somebody other than me. We have this idea of what, of the goal that we're trying to reach. And we have so much coupleism in the culture that often that goal is being chosen by somebody above all other people and then establishing your legacy with them. So that's supposedly one of the highest markers we can reach, especially as far as relationship standards are concerned. So you meet someone, you're dating around, then there may be some kind of intimacy, then there may be some kind of exclusivity, there's some kind of public naming, then there's a moving in together. After you move in together, there's the engagement, there's the wedding, there's the kids, there's the house, and then you pass the legacy on to the next generation. And so we have this idea that that's what a quote unquote successful relationship looks like. 
rather than ever, and I'm taking this from Andy Nordgren, this idea of customizing our commitments and going, what is it that I actually want? What is it that I'm choosing in this moment rather than the path that's already been set before me? And so a lot of the work that I like to do with people is really getting to like, what's working for you in this moment? And if you can imagine a future self, what would that future self want? And can you check in with that future self about whether or not you're doing right now what you need to do in order to get to that future self? Fuck yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I want to go back to one thing that you said there that I think is really important and has become so much more prevalent really just in the past five years, which is public claiming. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on public claiming? Um, I'm one of those people that I, I, I have a range of how much I like to be publicly claimed. Um, it's such a, it's, it's such a, uh, a good way to put it. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. So, you know, obviously I'm on this podcast with you. Um, so I like getting my name out into the world. Like I like being seen and heard and understood. That's like one of those things that feels really good for me. Um, I don't like it when there's any kind of ownership involved with it. When somebody is publicly claiming me as a way to dictate what I'm allowed to do or not allowed to do publicly and the kind of public shame that then can result if I don't align with whatever that other person's idea of what I should be doing because of the determinants of the relationship. Um, But I am a words of affirmation person using Gary Chapman's love languages. And so I do like it when people publicly go, we're proud of you or we celebrate you or we appreciate you. So as long as there's no strings attached, that kind of public claiming, you're one of us and we value you and we want to uplift you in the work that you're doing. That feels really good when it comes with strings attached. When somebody is publicly claiming me as a way to control my behavior, that's when I have to hold a boundary. Hmm. You could look at at controlling of behavior in a relationship in two ways, right? And and I think that a lot of it just comes down to to language. Like mm-hmm. one, uh, w- like one real um, way that people in open relationships make their case for it mm-hmm. is. They say, "I don't want to own someone else's sexuality," right? right? Which is like, yeah, I don't want to own slaves or sexuality you know like it's it's all in the language of owner like no one no one wants to own anyone else at least they don't want to say that you're right right Mm -hmm. um but there a lot of people feel more comfortable in various container agreements Mm -hmm. whether that's monogamy whether that's certain behaviors that you are in a sense controlling about your part you're controlling it but it's an agreed control Mm -hmm. how do you how do you parse the how do you parse those two conversations sure absolutely so i would start with whether the expectations in the relationship are explicit or implicit so if there's implicit expectations then you have to be a mind reader and there's this idea of like what good behavior is and what bad behavior is but that doesn't necessarily mean you agree on what those delineations are. So having a conversation where you're explicit, this is what I expect from the relationship. This is what I expect from you and our relating with each other. If my expectations can't be met, I may have to distance myself in some way, take some more space or decrease the intimacy in some way. So getting clear on what the implicit versus the explicit um, expectations are. And then as far as container agreements are concerned, um, I'm not opposed to them as long as nobody's rescuing. And I'm using the term rescue to mean doing more than your share or more than you want. So often there's this tit for tat. If I do more than my share or more than I want for you, then you're going to do more than your share or more than you want for me. And so it's this idea of like kind of puppet mastering your partner. Like I'm going to self-sacrifice in this moment because I expect you to do the same for me rather than having a really consent based conversation. Hey, this is really important to me. I would really appreciate it if you do that. Is that available? And then the other person gets to opt in and say, well, yeah, like I can tell like on a scale of one to 10, this is a nine for you on a scale of one to 10. This is a two for me. That would be super easy for me to do that for you. What's an example of that? Um, So for instance, um, 
if you were going to go to a party and let's say one person is high desire, they want to party all night, they want to socialize with everybody, they want to stay until the last person has left and the other person is low desire in mm. that moment and they're like, I want to go in, I want to be there for an hour, I just want to be seen and then I want to go home and have a quiet night with you, Netflix and chill, like get to bed early so that I can have my day the next day. So in that moment, um, the high desire person might be like, well, yeah, like I party all the time. So in this particular instance, I don't need to stay super long. I'd rather be there with you. Could we somehow compromise? Like, can you like tap me on the shoulder when you're like absolutely burnt out and you need to go? And that can be like my 15 minute or half hour warning. And then the low desire person can be like, well, yeah, like I really like I like being publicly claimed. I like being seen out with you in public. I like that you want me to be around your friends. So I'm willing to tolerate a little bit extra in that moment. But like, I'll let you know before I'm at my limit. So I'm not pissed at you for wanting to stay later after I've let you know that I already want to go home early. Mm. Whew, yeah, so much yes in that. <laughs> we think that I certainly did when I was younger, that everyone saw the world the same way that I did. Right. And that's a huge part of growing up. Yeah. And learning to work with people that don't see the world in the same way that you do right. is a massive superpower. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, little kids sitting in the back seat of cars. I thought that we were all on rails. I thought that cars were on rails because uh -huh. I remembered trains. Trains are on rails. Right. What would make me think that cars wouldn't be on rails? Right. Right. Like, <laughs> right. In, until someone tells you that and you're like, yeah. oh, shit. Right. I had no idea. Yeah. All I've ever seen is trains. Those are the moving things. Yes. And that's how you stay on the road. Yes. Um. My one of my guides actually asked me a question in session one time where she said, can you only love people who have the same worldview as you? And I, f I felt like I had gotten punched in the gut where all of a sudden I felt like this terrible person because I was like, oh, no, I've only been loving people who who think the same way that I do. And then all of my conflict is coming from people who have different worldviews than me and me trying to convince them that my worldview is superior in some way. And I, I recognized the domination and the oppression in my body in that moment. And I was like, oh, I, I have to learn how to love people who have different worldviews than me. And one of the nice things in my lineage is we use the Enneagram. And the Enneagram has nine different personality types. And so already you have nine different worldviews. And then within those nine different personality types, there are nine different levels of integration. So all of a sudden you have 81 different worldviews and you go, oh, now all of a sudden, even even if you mistype somebody, you're going, I can at least acknowledge that you're seeing the world from a different lens than I am. Mm. Do you think that uh, people need to have the same worldview to be in healthy relationships? I do not. I do not think they need to have the same worldview. I think they need to have um, common minimum standards around how they're going to treat each other respectfully and how they're going to communicate and having some kind of plan for how they're going to handle conflict. But I don't think people need to have the same worldviews in order to be in loving, healthy relationships. I wonder if it removes the sexual tension a bit. Like, mm. I wonder if it removes, like, if you have someone who's just like you, you're buddies. Like I mean, this, Esther Perel. I, I, I know those people who are just buddies. <laughs> yeah, they're good, they're, good they're friends. They're just good friends who live together and they <laughs> high five and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one, one throws a softball to the other and he hits it and they do a little skip together. Yeah. And the sex probably sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Esther Perel's whole thing is desire requires distance. Right. Yeah. You need a little bit of that negative and positive charge yeah. to create the spark. I hear you. Right. Yeah. Louis C.K. had a new special that came out recently that is uh, available on his website for ten dollars. Uh, it's just as dark as his past, but yeah. he had a joke about how. <laughs> oh God, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. Um, <laughs> like, he's like, you know, I think that gay rights, it's awesome. Like, you know, you can have a husband and a husband, and they go home and have sex. He's like, but I wonder if that, like, when it was wrong. Like, did it remove a little bit of that? Like, je ne sais quoi. He's like, you're in a bathroom. He's like, oh, I'm breaking my mother's heart right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, t tension is not bad. It's unresolved. It, it, conflict isn't bad. It's unresolved conflict. Yeah, absolutely. That's bad, right? And, and I think that what you're speaking to is the power and importance of communication. 
Absolutely. And John Gottman has some research around this where there are just going to be some unresolvable problems in all relationships. In fact, a, a, I think it might even be a majority of the problems in your relationships are going to be unresolvable. So then it's going, I'm not going to change your mind. You're not going to change my mind. I'm not going to change what I need. You're not going to change what you need. And yet we love each other enough that we're going to figure out a way to hold our discomfort within this relationship because there are still so many benefits to continue relating. So also normalizing that, like, yeah, not only is there going to be conflict and you're going to have to get through it, but there's not always going to be a win-win. There's not always going to be a resolution or a solution. And yet you can still stay in a loving, harmonious relationship with each other. Explain more about who John Gottman is and his work. Oh, sure. So um, he did a love lab in Seattle where he invited couples to come in and he hooked them up with mics. And I think he put heart monitors on them to like monitor when they were getting agitated or anxious. And he he just has all of this data around how to fight in a healthy way. And what he discovered is it's not the couple's like you can still yell at each other, you can still get agitated with each other, but he he has like a whole program for like as long as you turn towards each other when you're trying to get each other's attention, as long as you make repair attempts in addition to apologizing, not just saying I'm sorry, but going I can see that I affected you and I understand how I affected you and now I just want to do something nice not to change how you're feeling not to make you feel any differently about me but because I see you're hurting and I want to I want to take care of that pain it's it's more just like our, us being able to extend compassion and understanding for each other so a lot of his research is around that and he got it from this love lab where he uh he would have people bring all of their stuff and he would have them like set up like it was a regular day and then he'd be like why don't you bring up something that you guys have been fighting about. And then he would just watch how they would fight. And he got to the point where he could predict within 91% accuracy who was going to divorce and who wasn't, um, just watching how they f- they fought with each other. There was a ratio, right? Yeah, so um, he calls it the ma- magic ratio, where as long as there's five positive interactions to every one negative interaction, that that couple is probably um, going to do okay. And it's the same thing with bids for attention, where he realized... I think he calls them relationship masters and relationship disasters. I think that's his language where the masters turn towards each other's bids for attention 86% of the time. And the disaster is only about 33% of the time. Break that down. What's an example? So so let's say I'm on my phone and you're like, oh yeah, it was super sunny today. And I don't acknowledge you. I just keep looking at my phone. I have ignored your bid for attention in that moment. There's probably going to be a little heartbreak that happens. Um, if you say, oh, it was such a sunny day today. And I kind of like grunt, "Mm -hmm." I've at least acknowledged you. So there's still some engagement. I'm acknowledging that you're speaking to me. And then there's (laughs) the grunt. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows the grunt, (laughs) the, the, the vacant eyes staring at the phone (laughs) followed by the grunt. Followed by the grunt. We are cattle. Mm. (laughs) And then there's that moment where you're like, it was really sunny today. And I put my phone down and I turn to look at you and I make eye contact and I go, well, did you get outside today? And then that level of engagement feels really good. So maybe the interaction looked like it was going to be inconsequential, but me acknowledging that you're trying to get my attention in that moment creates an incredible amount of intimacy and connection. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's something I'm still learning. Like if, if someone set, makes a statement to me versus a question, versus a question, mm-hmm. well, if they make a statement, I Okay, I heard the statement. I have nothing else to offer that statement. Right. So I'm silent because I'm like, cool, you said the thing. It's out in the world now. Right. I don't have anything to add to that, but so often they get mad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? It's Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding about anger is that it's largely predicated upon not feeling like you're heard. Mm, Yeah. I mean, speaking as someone who gets angry easier than I get sad. Um, I know there's often some kind of fear or sadness or anxiety underneath the anger, but anger feels so powerful. It's energy for change and it gives you a boost of energy. So it's a whole lot easier sometimes to be angry than it is to be sad where you're low energy and like you feel a little bit like a victim and like you're a little hopeless. Um, So yeah, there's often something underneath the anger and I can also understand why anger is the easier response for Mm. sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, anger, anger can feel great it sometimes. Can, self-righteous oh. anger in oh. the moment feels great. Especially if you got your words with you. Oh, yeah. I brought my words in my suitcase. I'm dishing them out. Come yeah. at me. Come at Here me. Here are my facts. Yep. I'm articulating them clearly. Oh. You're going down. Oh, you'd be terrifying to get in a fight with. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, it's incredibly destructive. I can tell you from lots of experience. Yeah, I and then, but that's the thing, uh, you know, um, what happens after that self righteous anger, where I got to be right, you know, I got to win the argument. Um, the fallout after that is the guilt that I then feel, the damage that I then have to repair. So, um, as good in the moment as it feels, I've had to really recognize that the hangover afterwards isn't worth it. Hmm. And what do you do instead? So I, I, I'm a huge fan of meditation. I think it's going to save the world. Oh, yeah. Like MDMA and meditation. I hear you. Right. I'm and, right there with you. If, if we all got a th- therapist, Andrew Yang, I wish that he would have become president. He was going to offer couples therapy for free wow. for Americans. Yeah. I mean, that would have changed the world. Would have changed the world. Yeah. Why don't we offer couples therapy for free? Right. Knowing what a difference it is yeah. in our uh, society and the quality of interaction and community. I mean, like think about when you are in a shitty relationship or in a shitty spot in life, you're not engaging in your community Mm-mm. in any kind of productive way. And let's, you know, the, the United States is focused on money, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to be, you're, if you want to even use those metrics, like we're going to make more money if you're happy. Right. right. Like there's right. so much benefit that could come from these basic skills and and providing people the resources to make it through. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, a lot of people just don't know that it's possible to do it any other way because it's not what they were taught. Right. Right. Well, and the radical in me believes that it's it's not only not what we were taught, but that we were taught to live in an oppressive system and I mean, this goes from the Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, where he talks about the banking system of education, where the role of school is to get students to be able to be something that you can deposit information in, that then you can then retrieve that information out exactly as you put it in. And so it teaches this kind of obedience. And so I feel like so many of us have been schooled within that particular methodology of obedience that then when we become adults, it's really hard to subvert what the normal expectations are. Um, It takes an incredible amount of energy to be subversive and all of a sudden go, okay, what do I actually want? And white supremacy and the patriarchy and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism and all of the other systems of oppression They don't want us to be empowered. They don't want us to be relaxed. They don't want us to be in community because then we have all of this power. And then all of a sudden, instead of going, this is the path that's been laid out for me and I'm going to struggle along it and get as high as I can along that, that hierarchical ladder. Instead, people going, I'm, I'm going to create the life of my dreams and the life of my desires and what's optimal for me. I don't believe culture at large wants that for us. Hmm. Yeah, I think that it's that that goes back to a question of like who's who's running things and how organized is it? Yeah, I think that people largely make decisions due to incentives, mm. and if you set up a system with the wrong incentives, mm-hmm. where you know, quarterly profits are hailed above all else, you're going right. to get people to behave in a certain way. Right. So I think that the smartest way to create change is to create different incentives so, I that, love you, that. so that you can get the, the not so smart, not so thoughtful person to make the better decision more easily. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that we don't get too far away from relationship stuff. Sure. Um, and I had a burning question that I was going to ask you right, right after, uh, we we were getting into this. I totally forgot. So just come at me with some more relationship stuff and I'll think <laughs> about it. Sure. Sure. So when I talk about relationships, I also want to be clear that because I'm a relationship anarchist, I'm not just talking about romantic sexual relationships. I'm talking about all of the relationships in my life. And one of the things that I think is really important for me is making sure that the person you're having sex with doesn't automatically become the most important relationship in your life. If that happens organically, that's fine. But again, this coupleism in the culture where we go, 
everything has to revolve around you and you're going to have veto power over every other relationship in my life isn't something I subscribe to. So I just want to be clear that when I'm talking about relationships, I'm also talking about my friends and I'm also talking about my coworkers and I'm also talking about my family. So these techniques that I'm talking about aren't just for romantic relating either. Hmm. Yeah, there's an expectation that you're going to devalue all other relationships in your life Mm -hmm. when you're in a a primary relationship. And if you don't do that, it makes the person feel less special. Absolutely. And so um, there is this idea around when is it your time to be special and when is it your time to be ordinary? And it's not always the moment to be special. There are some moments when you need to be ordinary in order to have a functional relationship. Mm. I wonder how much that idea comes from um, a culture that values fame and Mm. being special so much. Yeah. I think that a lot of our problems are due to the ideals that we hail um, really unbalanced people. Mm-hmm. who got really good at one thing yeah and it's there's the a kind of lopsidedness to them oh yeah where they're super developed in one thing but not very developed in in the rest right. um but it allows them to get a ton of attention and most most of the time these people are just tweaked out and if right. they don't they've created a lot of barriers in their life to maintain a normal human psyche yeah uh I wonder, though, if in other cultures like uh, China mm-hmm. that doesn't in, doesn't value individuality and individual expression as much, mm-hmm. if that uh, belief is also true, that by being the primary partner, all other relationships are going to be less important in a way. That's a really interesting question. I don't know that I can speak to that with any kind of authority, but I know just because it is more of a collective culture versus an individualistic one, that the family is really important Mm. and being multi-generational is really important. And that's something that we don't have as much here in at least white America. Hmm. Yeah, the family is much more, uh, that, that unit is much more important in a lot of other cultures yeah i mean even you go to hawaii and it's the aunties and the uncles and all the aunties right you know we're not putting them away in in homes right right um so how do you how do you square that like if if you're talking with a couple who has a problem about around that idea of specialness Mm -hmm. how do you um recommend that they communicate or tactics to get through that in a way that doesn't really af- um, offend one or the or the other. What? Right? Yeah, like no. the idea that you're not special or that you're replaceable yeah. is terrifying to right. hear, right? Right. And you're one of seven billion people, right? So how do you square those two things? I mean, one, I I like to to validate the fear first. Like, yeah, if I wasn't with you, the likelihood that I would fall in love with somebody else and still have a happy, successful relationship is high Um, because I'm committed to working on myself and I tend to surround myself with good people. And so the likelihood that I would be able to have another loving relationship, that's real. Like if I wasn't with you, it's not like you're going to be the last person that I'm ever going to be with, no matter how much I love you. That being said, there is a very specific, unique alchemy that can only be created. Like the alchemy that I have with you, Kyle Nobody else can have the alchemy that we have because I'm bringing my energy, you're bringing your energy, and we're creating a third something that nobody else is ever going to be able to recreate. I mean, you and I wouldn't even be able to recreate this moment if I met with you the next Friday and we decided to talk about the same things. The energy would still be different between the two of us. There would be a different alchemy there. So recognizing, again, like, yes, ordinary, like, we fall in love and there are lots of people to fall in love with because there are lots of wonderful people in the world and we're all trying to, like, organize around each other. And then also there's something completely unique that can never be recreated. Um, So being able to see that spectrum. And then where I go is I tend to see where there's scarcity for the person who's not feeling chosen or not feeling special. 
in what way are your needs not being met? And is there a way that we can get your needs being met rather than you needing to make sure that other people don't get their needs met? So rather than trying to keep other people from having what it is that they want and need, I try to get that person what it is they want and need and then see if that shifts how they feel about the, the dynamic. What's an example of that? So for instance, if um, let's say you want more one-to-one undivided attention quality time and your partner works all the time and you're nesting partners and so you live together. So it's become this really casual arrangement where one person comes home, the other person's already on their phone, on the couch, like you give the quick kiss hello and then you kind of settle down into whatever your evening routine is where you turn the TV on or you start making dinner together. And then that person who came home from work is like, oh, by the way, I'm going to go and have coffee with this friend of mine. And there's no distractions. You're not on your devices. You're having an hour long conversation. You're making eye contact with each other. You're checking in about how the day went. The person at home might then be like, I want that. I want that distraction free disruption in the routine moment where you're fully present with just me in that moment. I would want to make sure that person I was like, well, how much undivided attention would you need before you felt satisfied? where you felt comfortable with that person giving somebody else attention because your attention needs have already been met. And that goes back to the work that you've done with Qigong and presence. Well, I mean, um, I'm putting words in your mouth. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Qigong was the start of a lot of this, um, being able to watch the watcher or like witness who the observer was. And it was, um, (laughs) <laughs> my, my first few Qigong classes, I was irritated the entire time. Um, you know, we're like doing these repetitive motions. We're supposed to be breathing and like, when are we going to move on to the next thing? And the dancer in me just was like, and five, six, seven, yeah. eight, what's next? I could be doing a workout right now. Exactly. I'm not, I'm not sweating. Like, yeah. Um, and so what was helpful for me in those moments was um, Dan Millman from The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Sure. Um, he has the, these questions that he was asked in it. Um, and it was, where are you here? What time is it now? What body? This one. And I had to ask myself those questions over and over again in order to develop present moment awareness and not this constant like future planning. Mm. And then did something shift for you with Qigong? I mean, You're what? Like, it's still boring. <laughs> I mean, those, I just remember those early. It was the water flows. It was always the water flows because they're so slow and um, relaxing. I enjoy it now. I absolutely do enjoy it now. Um, but, you know, like there's this moment of like, what agitation are we trying to bounce away from? Like, what is it in ourselves that we've put a numb layer on top of or that we don't want to acknowledge because we're worried about how painful it's going to be? And again, like I I talked about my anger, it's really easy for me to get irritated or frustrated or impatient. Um, You know, I can have a quick fuse and it's not surprising to me that in those moments when I slowed down and was being present with myself, that it would be irritation that would bubble up when that was this part of me that was so natural and organic as a response to discontent or um, a feeling of powerlessness. Um, I remember, I remember my first Qigong class where I was doing a sequence that always used to really irritate me. And then I, I absolutely fell in love with it that day. And it felt like I had reached like a, a new plateau where I was like, oh, this is actually enjoyable now because I'm no longer agitated with myself. Did your relationships change at all? Dramatically, dramatically. Um, I was such a, a human doing versus a human being where I was constantly trying to like, optimize and fix and problem solve and when I could just sit with what was when I could just sit with like this kind of sucks right now or this is kind of frustrating right now or I'm not getting exactly what I want right now and I could I could have genuine curiosity about that moment rather than trying to immediately change it or fix it um it changed my relationships because when I stopped needing to change the moment and I stopped needing to change how I was feeling about the moment I also stopped needing to fix and change other people and so I stopped treating everything like it was broken oof preach sister preach (laughs) have you read uh when things fall apart by pema chodron i've read pieces of it i've never read it all the way through so good (laughs) yeah absolutely (sighs) yeah she uh underscores that point of not of giving up hope yeah and the importance of giving up hope Mm. 
which is so antithetical to what we're taught. Yeah. But in a way, hope is um, an inability to be with what is now. Yeah. I had someone reframe that slightly for me where I was allowed to still have hope as long as I didn't have any attachment to the hope. Mm. And the the other side of the coin of that was I was also allowed to grieve as long as I didn't sink into despair. Oh, and what's the difference between grief and despair? So there's a heaviness in despair that I don't necessarily experience in grief. Like there's still a weight in grief for sure. Um, like I can... I was just thinking my favorite way to grieve is like laying down on the floor in the dark, listening to Samuel L. Barber's adagio for strings, like just like in the sad of it where you're just like feeling how, how sad you are. My favorite way is to post happy photos on Instagram. <laughs> oh, that's a little twisted. <laughs> I think that's how our culture is grieving right now. Yeah. I mean that. Bypass, how you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's super brittle, shiny, fragile. <laughs> Yeah, you could you could crack I'm, it easily. I'm fine. <laughs> um, but <laughs> YOLO. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No bad days. No bad days. Right. Love and light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but Love. so there's a spiraling down in despair. Yeah. Whereas like grief, there is like a release, or there's something cathartic that happens. Yeah. So there is the again. It it feels like a a distinction that I had to practice in my body before it made sense. It feels a little bit like, um, there's, um, there's a tribe in South America where they have like 35 different names for what we call like blue green. Like they can just see like so many different variations of this culture because they've trained the capacity to make distinctions. And I feel like there is a little bit of that with like grief and despair and hope and Ooh, attachment. Blue green. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> That's also one of my favorite things about growing up, learning to notice more. Right. You start to notice more blue greens right. around your whole life. When you're a baby, it's just like happy, the worst sadness ever, you yes. know, yes. that everything is the most, is the best or the worst. Oh, There's yeah. not a lot of nuance, but yeah. as, as you get older, like I see why old people get into bird watching. Oh Yeah so much noticing in bird watching. Oh yeah. Right. But if you're, if you're a kid, you're like, no, I want to go jump off a 10 stair on a skateboard because this is extreme, right? Yeah. Like life, you begin to, um, see more layers to the game. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I like talking about presence. I think that there's, something really profound in an ability to give up the war. Yes. And when people realize that there is a war going on inside their own minds, it can be revolutionary. Yes. Yes. And I consider myself a warrior. Um, I know the phrase that's been bouncing around in my mind is there's no hill not worth dying on. And so like asking, my <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, asking myself to be strategic in moments like you're terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> um, uh, but also this idea of like so often. And again, Nancy Chanteau was the one that introduced me to this concept. But so often we're fighting to not lose mm. versus fighting to win. And so if you are going to go to battle, making sure you're being strategic and that you're trying to get what it is that you want rather than trying to keep yourself from losing something or trying to prevent something that you don't want. Hmm. Do you write down what it is that you want? And is there an exercise that you partake in often or recommend that people partake in so that they can even figure out what that 100 percent is? Oh, yeah. Um, I think writing it down is super important. When you write something down, the thought has to complete. So if it's just in your head, it can keep looping. They're, they can just link one after the other. But when you write something down, you you put a period, period at the end of it or an exclamation point or a question mark. But you finish. You finish the thought. So writing things down, I think, is really important to figuring out what it is that you want. 
As part of constructing your 100%, it's really important to hold what we call a compound 100%. So recognizing where you have a split in your body, where there are competing contradictory needs, things that seem like they might be in opposition to each other and creating enough space in your body to go, it doesn't make sense linearly, logically, but I want both of these things. Hmm. And so writing that down and being able to see the full complexity of what it is that you want actually allows you the opportunity to get closer rather than going, okay, well, I want this thing. This other thing that I want doesn't make sense. So I'm going to let go of that. You're, you're letting go of so much of what your wants and needs are in that moment. But when you can write it all down on paper and you can go, oh, like, no wonder I'm having a hard time figuring out how to get this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of competition in my wants right now. Um, and it's helpful to see that on paper. Right. What's an example of a conflicting want that you see in your work? Oh, sure. So, I mean, this is like variety versus security, right? Some sense of adventure and excitement versus safety and security. I mean, we all have that to varying degrees. But this idea of like, yeah, I want to be able to go on trips and meet new people and have this life of adventure. Oh, and by the way, I also want to create a home space where I can sleep in my own bed and have some kind of routine and consistency. Um, that's super common. Yeah. And how do you uh, recommend that people reconcile wanting a house and still having a passport? Right, right. So number one is being able to name it like, oh, I want these two things and they're not always going to line up with each other neatly. Um, putting a bigger horizon of time around it is super helpful. So for instance, um, the example that I like to use is I'm a dancer, right? So I go to dance class a certain amount of times every week, but then there are also other things that I want to do with my evening sometimes too. I want to have a meal with somebody or I want to just relax. So if I'm working within like a particular moment, I can't go to dance class and go to dinner and also do nothing at home. But if I put a bigger time window around that, if I do it over the course of a week, I can probably get those competing needs met. I'll go to dance class on Monday. I'll have dinner on Tuesday. I'll chill out on Wednesday. I can get everything that I want if I put a bigger time frame around it. That's so strategic. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I forget who said this, so I apologize for stealing the quote, but we, the quote is we uh, overestimate what we can do in a day and underestimate what we can do in a year. Oh, I, I just got chills when you said that. I love that. Isn't that good? It's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't need to happen now. We got to take the urgency out of it. Right. And, and, and doing what's important more than what's what's urgent right like I yes. think that that can it's really easy to catastrophize oh yeah when you're not getting what you want right in the moment yes rather than playing the long game right hmm. yep um you're knocking out of the park this is your first podcast this is my first podcast Freaking well done you're <laughs> crushing you. it how's Thank it feel you. it feels amazing I love doing this with you it's super fun yeah super it's the, fun it's the best it's the best I can't believe it's my job <laughs> um, it's, it's just so much fun um what are some other so we talked about depletion mm -hmm. we talked about um ownership and security mm -hmm. talking about putting a bigger horizon line on problems um the importance of presence and what it would look like if you gave up the war yeah what are some other aspects of your work that you think are superpowers Sure. I mean, the one that's mind blowing for so many of us is what we call the rescue triangle. It's the rescue dynamic. And I mentioned rescue earlier and we define rescue as doing more than your share or more than you want. And often there can be a good motive behind that. There can be a positive intention like I want you to feel good. So I'm going to self-sacrifice in this moment so that you're happy. But then when it turns out that person still has a bad day or still has a hard time, we can feel all this resentment in our bodies because we were trying to produce a certain outcome that didn't result. Mm. So after we rescue, what happens is um, there's some kind of burnout. There's a drop in energy that happens and we sink down into this victim state where we're doing less than our share and less than we want, where we feel powerless, we feel sad, we feel depressed, we feel depleted. And that state feels awful. And so then there's a rebellious energy that rises in our body and we move into persecutor where then we're angry and we're irritated and we're resentful and we tend to not act in alignment with our best version of ourselves. So then we feel guilty. And because we feel guilty, we start rescuing again, doing more than our share, more than we want as a way to try to repair. 
this is the way that most people are conducting their negotiations, their interactions, and it is incredibly depleting and not very efficient at creating healthy relationships. How do you recommend that people uh, move outside of the triangle? If you're in rescuer, if you're in victim, if you're in persecutor, if you're in burnout, if you're in rebellion, if you're in guilt, regardless of where you are on the triangle, the antidote is what we were talking about earlier. Um, and it's figuring out your 100% and asking for it. So we say ask for your 100%, 100% of the time. doesn't mean you'll get it, but at least the person has all of the information and can consent into whatever the dynamic is if you've been completely clear about what it is you want and need. All right. And do you recommend that people write that down prior? Oh, and, yeah. And how do you and how do you recommend that people uh, state a hundred percent without um, doing it in a tone that makes the other person defensive? Yeah. So I use a scale. Like if you're in your green zone, if you're feeling centered and balanced, you've had enough sleep, you've had a meal. Yellow, you can still have a reasonable conversation, but that's definitely like a proceed with caution. And if you're in a red zone. Do not talk. Do not make the request. Do not have the conversation. Wait until you're back into green. Um, I'm also a really big fan of not having drive-by conversations. So, hey, I want to talk to you about whatever the topic is. Um, I want to talk to you about, you know, how we're doing the dishes on a scale of one to ten. It's about a four for me. I think it's going to take about 15 minutes. When would be a good time to talk? I've got time on Friday. So you're giving people information on the front end and then you're allowing them to opt into the conversation rather than just immediately launching into like, I'm so sick and tired of the fact that there are still dishes in the sink every night. And when I wake up in the morning, then there's no room for me to make my coffee. Not a super productive conversation, but being able to go like, hey, I want to talk to you about this thing. Do you want to talk about this thing? When would be good is a lot more helpful. Hmm. Yeah. There... Uh, difficulty is and, and conflict in a relationship is often seen as a bad thing. And I've noticed people dip out at a certain point in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Usually it's like a six months to a year in again and again and again. Yeah. What is it that causes that? Well, we know some people call it limerence. Um, I refer to it as NRE, which is new relationship energy. Um, where we know new relationship energy, right. yeah, <laughs> similar to BD, big, big dick energy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's there. Yeah, it's got some BD, got some BD NR in that NRE. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to a BLM protest. <laughs> yeah, bring that BDE to your BLM protest with your NRE. ASAP. ASAP. Um. LOL. <laughs> We're well, on, we Sarah. We're on fuego <laughs> right now. Whew. I got no sleep last night. I'm running on fumes. <laughs> I love that. Uh, um, what were we talking about? We were, we were talking oh. about about the um, <clears throat> the uh, thing that some people get into where they have NRE, yeah, and then that starts to fade, it starts and, to and fade. they dip out because yeah. we got hinge. Because <laughs> we got hinged. We got hinged. We got hinged. Um, so about six months, NRE lasts about six months to two years. And so that moment when all of a sudden the rose-colored glasses come off and you can see the horns, like it hits around that six-month mark, somewhere between six months and two years. So if people are chasing that kind of honeymoon high and all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, it was so easy. I was willing to overextend myself and now I'm not. That's why a lot of people dip out at that moment. Now the thing is, is it's a real chemical connection that's happening during NRE and if you can work through conflict in a humane way there's a deeper level of intimacy that can then arise when you go we have dignified differences and we can hold space for those dignified differences and we have a system for how we work through those in a way where we both feel seen heard and understood that is a level of connection that is that is very different than NRE hmm. How much emphasis do you put on the little things? Uh, kisses, writing poetry, the way you greet a person, your person, winks, like those little details in between. Mm -hmm. I feel that often th there's like, I don't know, there's like big issue, big like capital I issues yeah. and lower and lowercase issues. Yeah. And often, I, I don't know. I'm asking this. 
I think that attention to detail is really important. Yeah. And can and can raise the tide and uh, and often solve some of those bigger issues in life, yeah. whether it's relationally or work wise, whatever that is. Um, how much do you recommend that couples focus on details and those little kind of sweet things. I was listening to a podcast with someone who'd, who'd been in a very happy long-term relationship. And he said that that was that the two things they really focused on were one, uh, letting each other really be their own person mm -hmm. and supporting that. And yeah. two, focusing on those little details. Like if they knew that the other person had a big day at work, they would like write a sexy note for them yeah. to wake up on. Like just those things that create buoyancy. Yeah. Um, again, Gottman talks about this being like deposits in your emotional bank account. Mm. So every time you do one of those little things, you're creating a savings so that then when those big things hit, you already have your savings account that you can pull into. Um, for me, people don't even necessarily need to be super successful at those little things as long as I can see they're trying, as long as they're making some kind of effort. So people can fail, people can be messy, people can forget. But if they're trying to do those little things, that is implies a certain level of care and connection that that counts for me even if like for instance you were talking about the kiss coming home I love that I love that like that long kiss when you for, not just the quick peck but that long kiss when somebody first walks through the door if somebody's forgotten that I have no problem being like hey remember I super love it getting those long kisses and they're like oh oh right I forgot and then they come over and like they start kissing me but then they're like oh but there was this thing I wanted to tell you about at work I'm like I see that you're trying in this moment and I'm going to keep reminding you. And there's something around high desire and low desire here where sometimes somebody is going to be a higher desire for a certain little interaction and somebody else is going to be lower desire. And the high desire person then makes the agreement, I'm going to remind you because this is really important to me and I get that it's not super important to you. And the low desire person is going to go, I'm going to try. This isn't necessarily what I organize around, but I care about you. So I'm going to try to remember this more than I otherwise would. And that trying to move towards each other means at least as much to me as the interaction itself. Mm. You put a lot of emphasis on autonomy mm -hmm. and codependent relationships are not healthy. Um, how would you how would you define a codependent relationship? Yeah, so I think I need to make a distinction between codependency and lots of entanglement. Mm. So there can be overlapping spheres where you might work together, you might play together, you might live together, you might share finances together. That kind of entanglement is fine as long as there's lots of consent and choice and people are doing it because they want to and not just because they think they should. Codependency feels like there's a lot of rescue wrapped up in that to me where people are doing more than they want, more than their share. They're depleting themselves. Their their tank is is running on low or running on empty. I mean, like it's really things can look the same, but feel very different. So in a codependent relationship, maybe someone is dependent on somebody for their financial security. Maybe somebody is dependent on somebody for their shelter. So they're nesting together. They're sharing resources but it, it doesn't feel good versus somebody who's in a more entangled relationship where they're going, yeah, but like we love pooling our resources and we nest together so easily. It can, it can look the same, but feel very different. So I do make that distinction. Mm, I like that a lot. Uh, and if someone finds themselves in a codependent relationship, how do you recommend that they rediscover their autonomy? Sure. So usually it has something to do with power. So again, like using the financial um, aspect, if you don't have enough money that you could leave the relationship where you could have your own housing space where you could feed yourself, we probably need to get you more financial power. If you are suffering from low self-esteem and the other person is super confident or in any way um, attacks your sense of self, we probably need to boost your self-esteem and your confidence in some way. So if you're in a codependent relationship, I would really be looking at who has what power and how are they using it and who needs to increase their power so that they actually can come from a place of choice and not just feel stuck. Right. <clears throat> People who get married and then divorced mm -hmm. often don't remarry because it breaks them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, it on a, on a spiritual level to get into an, an agreement with someone where, your finances are so connected. Your life is so connected that as a result of you not being able to work out whatever it is, you're 
sex life, mm-hmm. your communication, you know, these fights, your entire life shatters. Right. Um, and a lot of those people say, I never would have done it if I would have known. Right. right. But but you have the blinders on when you're falling in love. And that's what we're told we should do. We should get married. And that's the da, 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 da. and then you're like, whoa, this a lot of this a lot of this doesn't work out. What's the actual argument for marriage? Right. Right. And right. I wonder, do you th- always th- like think in your life and do you think it's healthy to think at all times, even if you're madly in love with someone? What if this doesn't work out? Like, what is my do you think that an exit strategy is healthy at all times to make sure that it's not going to shatter if it doesn't work out? I mean, I know personally the way I orient is to always have an exit strategy where I go, this is how I would take care of myself if things went south. And having that allows me to not scan and track for danger so much because right. I go, if something were to go wrong, I know how I take care of it and I trust myself to take care of it. So now I actually don't have to hold it anymore. Right. Um, so I do tend to have an exit strategy where I go, this is how I take care of myself financially. This is how I take care of myself emotionally. Like this is how much money I need in savings in order to feel like I can leave whenever I need to leave. These are the people who are in my support pod who I can go to, who are going to help me through the emotional turmoil that I'm going through. So I have all of those systems in place already so that I know that I'm staying in a relationship because I want to and not because I have to. Right. And that's new for women. Right. 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 And it's, it's so great that women are becoming more independent Mm -hmm. and get to start asking themselves those questions because for a very long time, I mean, you you could make the argument that hunter gather societies had healthier relationships because it was so much more egalitarian, less ownership over the person. But marriage was initially brought about as a property rights issue. Right. 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 So, uh, you know, and if a man raped your wife, you know, he would go to, he would get in trouble for damaging your property. Right. Like, whoa, that was not that long ago that we had those kinds of laws in place. So I think that it's, it's wonderful how, um, financial autonomy allows women to be able to start asking these questions that they were simply unable to ask. Right. For, hundreds of years prior. Right. So, yeah, and I think that it's all, so how do you square that with people who say like, well, yeah, but if you have an exit strategy, that means that you're not fully in it. That means that you're not like, that you don't, you must not believe in this relationship. I mean, I, I see it a little bit as like, I like to surf bigger waves and I like to think about what's going to happen if I wipe out and and I love making the wave. It's the best feeling ever. Mm-hmm. But to only focus on that mm-hmm. feels short sighted. I think there's a lot of idealism in that, and um, I think that idealism is really dangerous. And I think there's a reason why the Disney movies and the fairy tales end with the marriage, and then you don't get to see what happens after that in the storyline. You mm-hmm. don't get to see how they navigate all of the real life complexities afterwards. So. I mean, again, if I'm if I'm validating a little bit of the fear here, maybe I'm not ever 100 percent fully committed to it because this idea that I'm going to predict what I want five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I have no idea who I'm going to be in that moment. And I need to leave myself some spaciousness to grow and change. And that means maybe never fully committing to something for life. Um, Franklin View talks about this with marriage, that it's a life sentence and that it's only considered a successful marriage if one person doesn't make it out alive, right? Till death do us part. Oh, God damn. She got the chills. And that is not my definition of a successful relationship. And he also says that the people in the relationship are more important than the relationship. Hmm. And so that is one of my core principles when I'm organizing with people is that the people in the relationship are more important than the relationship. So this idea of having some kind of exit strategy, it's like, yeah, I can't say that this relationship is always going to be the most important thing to me. I can say I am always going to be the most important thing to me and you are important to me and I'm going to take care of us before I take care of the relationship. You mentioned validating the fear. Yeah. What does that mean? Um, So often what happens is when somebody is talking to us and they're telling us all of their, their worries and their anxieties, 
if it's somebody that we really care about, our first move is to go, here are all the reasons why you're wrong to be worried. I'm super committed to you. I'm super in love with you. Here's all the security and stability that I can offer you. And what that tends to do to people is people have a fear for a reason. We might not always know what that reason is, but by invalidating that fear, it actually drives it deeper into the body where they're going, now I feel crazy. Now I feel confused. Now I don't know why I think this. This person isn't giving me any kind of information, Like, but I'm feeling the way that I'm feeling for some reason. Why is that? So if your first move can be like, I imagine the reason why you're worried about this is because, and you can in some way validate the experience that they're having, it can relax the fear in their body enough that then they can hear all of the ways in which it's not true. But so we say what's true about the fear first and then move to what's not true about it so that they can actually hear all of the extra details. It's counterintuitive though. Super counterintuitive and really challenging to do when there's somebody in distress in front of you and all you want to do is make them feel better. Do you have a script that you recommend people could use? to mm -hmm. make it through a situation like that? Sure. So um, that particular part of the script would be, we say what's true, what's not true, and what's also true. What's an example? So an example of, um, let's say somebody comes towards me and they're going, I'm worried that our friendship isn't as important to you anymore because you haven't been around as much. Okay, I could say, well, what's true is, what's true is that like, yeah, I've started prioritizing building my business more. And so the amount of free time I have available is less. You're right, like I have been extending to you less and I have been reaching out less because I have been prioritizing this other thing over this, this friendship that we've been having. What's not true is that your friendship means any less to me. You're still super important to me. Um, I've probably been taking it for granted a little bit because it's so well established. And so I haven't been tracking it as closely as I've been tracking other things. What's also true is we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of this current um, social justice uprising for BLM. So me wanting to make an impact in the world is also taking up a lot of my effort and energy. But I am willing for you to remind me that interpersonal relationships are just as important as this global scale that I'm trying to operate on. So you can remind me. And so we're like telling this complex story about like, yeah, you're right. Like I haven't, I haven't been paying you as much attention and I'm sorry for that. And also you're still important to me for these reasons. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> validating the fear, uh, being autonomous. What do you see in your experience of, of you know, having worked with a bunch of different <clears throat> couples and, Obviously, looking at relationships through this magnifying glass, um, what do you see as the value of a long-term relationship? And what do you see as the value of marriage? Sure. So long-term relationships, there is something that's super compelling about somebody who has been able to be with you as you've changed, where they're like, I remember you as you were then, I see you as you are now, and I'm holding this vision of what you're saying you want to be. Somebody who has all of the information in order to really be able to recognize past, present, and future selves feels deeply intimate to me. And also when there is some kind of like, we've been through it, we've been through the fire, and look, we're both still choosing to be here, there is such a, a security in that and it feels like such a safe place to rest that I super value that. Um, I, I deeply value the long-term committed relationships in my life. When you talk about marriage, when you talk about a legal contract, a legally bind, binding contract that you're signing, signing, rather, there are social benefits to signing that document. So medical access, being able to share your financial wealth. Um, that is how our culture creates access to that kind of community building within a household. So marriage still makes sense to me as far as that's concerned. And then like, as far as a more romantic notion, I mean, I really do like this idea that you're going, we're in a relationship with each other. We're going to get married. Often marriage is this very public ceremony and it's you standing in front of your community, your chosen community and going, we've chosen each other and we are going to need help. We are not going to be able to get through this relationship in isolation on our own. We are going to need you to remind us 
that we chose this. We need you to support us through this. We need you to hold us accountable through this. And so there is something that feels very community oriented about a marriage where you're going, we can't do this alone. We need all of you. Will you stand and witness us as we try to do this? That was beautiful. Thank you. What is it that you are most, what aspect of your work are you most interested in developing right now? I have a positive obsession right now, and that's with whatever the skills are going to be needed post-collective liberation. And again, I'm taking this from um, Skills for Change lineage holder Nancy Chanteau, where she very clearly says, post-collective liberation, there's no longer oppression. We're no longer dominating and controlling each other. We are still going to be differentiated, precious vessels with autonomy. How are we going to create meaningful lives if we can no longer get what we want through dominance? So you're in a different vessel than I'm in. We're going to have dignified differences. Even if you're coming from self-love all the time and I'm coming from self-love all the time and we've made a commitment to each other that we're not going to dominate each other in order to get what we want, how then are we going to navigate conflict because conflict is still going to happen because we're different lenses. I think we're different lenses of spirit. So we're going to want different things. So we're still going to need cooperative communication. We're still going to need conflict resolution. We're still going to be able to have enough spaciousness in our bodies that I can want what I want and I can hear what you want. And there's still space left over without getting overwhelmed. So teaching people the skills that are going to be needed post-collective liberation, are it's super compelling to me right now. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts on psychedelic therapy? I mean, we know that neurons that wired, fire together wire together. And sometimes, some skills for change is an effort-based practice. And it requires energy, and it requires effort, and it requires intention, and it requires time. So it's all this efforting. Sometimes we also need more effortless-based interventions. And so this idea that you could take some kind of medicine that would then help you rewire your brain or help you see new possibilities. It feels like you need both. You need an effortless based intervention and you need an effort based intervention and being able to combine those things is where real magic can happen. I agree. I think that the integration is where the conversation of psychedelic therapy is going now. Right. It's less about the fireworks and that jaguar that you saw on ayahuasca right. that told you that it's your relationship with your father that needs healing. <laughs> right. And that's why you tried to build this business. And really, you just need to tell him that you love him. Uh, <laughs> right. But then after that, you know, after the jaguar comes, you need effort. And right. I am I'm so impressed with the pragmatism of skills with cha skills for change. Um, and I'm a huge fan of what it is that you are doing. Um, you're really helping to change the world. Well, thank you. That I feel that in my heart. Yeah. Thank you. I, that means a lot to me to hear you say that. And are you open to getting new clients right now? I would love new clients. Great. How did they find you? They can find me. I've got a website, be the radical way.com. They can also email me at be the radical way at gmail.com. Be the radical way at gmail.com. Uh, any parting words for uh, our loving audience? Sure. We have this idea that we're going to find somebody else and they're going to complete us. And I strongly believe that along the lines of radical self-love, that whatever this this emptiness, this hole that we feel, feel inside of ourselves, that we are the only thing that can fill that hole. And so when you can hold yourself exactly as you are, the things that you love about yourself, the things that you're trying to change about yourself, and the things that you have a hard time looking at in yourself, when you can hold that with acceptance, that the relationships in your life are going to radically transform because you will be able to come into them as a whole person who loves yourself. You'll be able to then embrace somebody else's wholeness. Hey, it's Kyle again. Head over to trendswithbenefits.com and sign up for our newsletter to get weekly stories about psychedelics, adventure, and well-being.